Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, this is Local Chat, episode 192. You can't say things like that, Ian, right before I'm about to talk. Folks, uh, we are Local Chat. We talk about video games all sorts of other dumb shit. I'm your host, Will Crosby. Joining me this week is the one and only Kyle Bailey. Hi, it's been a minute, but I'm happy to be here. And speaking of minutes, Ian Gibson. Hello, I am also here tonight. He keeps the minutes of every local chat and then he reads them back to me at night to help me fall asleep. <laughs> um, we are here, uh, like I said, to talk about video games. But first, we got a little chit chat section where we, um, you know, we like to talk um, and talking to yep. your kids about Jesus is the best thing you can do. Uh, um, mm. Pinball. Next best thing about Jesus is pinball. Microsoft pinball. Microsoft pinball. Ian, did you buy a pinball machine? I did not. I, so I, we talked about this. So, uh, went to Will's birthday party a couple weeks ago. We went to Morristown Game Vault. Shout out to them. I actually, uh, Morristown Game Vault, I looked it up beforehand. There's actually a documentary on YouTube. It's like a short documentary about That's it. That's so funny. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we went there and they got a, they've got a, a lot of pinball machines. They have probably, I don't know, maybe like 15 pinball machines, I would say, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, so we were playing some pinball. Maggie was with me, and I was. it was one of those moments where I was like, man, pinball's really cool. And I was like, Maggie, should we buy a pinball machine? And she's like, yeah, we should. And I was like, oh, okay, she said it. <laughs> okay, fuck. <laughs> alert, alert. So I was, yeah, so I've been looking at pinball machines, but there's a problem. And basically the problem is there's two types of pinball machines. There's an electromechanical machine. <laughs> and there's a solid state machine and the solid state machine started in the seventies and the eighties. It's basically, does it use a chip at all? And if it mm. doesn't, it's electromechanical, which is really cool. Um, but the problem is, and those machines are a lot cheaper, but the problem is they're a little bit harder to maintain. They're older. So they're not as in good shape and they're generally not as, I don't want to say as cool, but they're not as complex or mm -hmm. exciting while you're playing them because they're they're a little bit limited. They're still doing a lot of crazy stuff. So anyways, you could get an electromechanical machine for like in good condition for like fifteen hundred bucks, which I'm like, OK, that's not bad. You know, I don't really want one of those, but that's that's not terrible. But then I would start looking at solid state machines. And if you want to use solid state machine in good condition, it's basically four thousand dollars or more. And I'm like, damn, like, that's wow. too much. That's too much for me. But anyways, it has made me. um want to play more pinball so this past weekend uh maggie and i were up in long island for a wedding and we went to a place called pinball long island uh which was an awesome place they have this is a conservative estimate they have at least 50 pinball machines there like just a shitload of pinball machines and it's basically 20 bucks per adult for an all day all you can play pass so so That's maggie so and i went we were there for about 45 minutes. I went through and I played. I, I tried to play every single machine. Some of them weren't working. Some of them were taken. So I probably played like 30 pinball machines. And uh, pinball's pretty cool. You guys like pinball? I surprisingly liked it. I, I surprised uh, <clears throat> at my own birthday party. Uh, I was surprised that I was playing more um pinball machines than arcade machines they were super fun there was that awesome yeah. godzilla one where like halfway through it like plays what is basically the gamecube game godzilla king of monsters where you choose who you're gonna fight and then how you do like specific lanes light up and if you get the ball into those lanes it does like godzilla attacks uh and that was super fun and i wanted to take it home and i couldn't they arrested me yeah yeah how about you kyle what's your what's your pinball take yeah, so my uh, my godparents used to have a really nice pinball machine in their basement, and we would go to their house whenever my mom wanted to hang out with my, she's technically my aunt, so it's a weird situation, but we would play pinball, and then we would play Medal of Honor on my friend's uh, PS2, and like that was, that was all we did in that basement. And then, of course, like Galaxy uh, Pinball, whatever whatever it's uh -huh. called on windows whatever, whatever that yeah. pinball game is oh space, hours. space cadet space cadet like yeah yeah hours and hours yeah. of that and uh yeah i i'm i'm a fan i i'm so surprised 
by how complicated pinball is because it's if i may describe it as i understand it is it's <laughs> it's literally it's not just like oh hit the targets and some targets are worth more than others the machines are like okay all right you you hit like i'll give you an example i was playing the scooby-doo machine and the scooby-doo machine was like okay you need to start a case so first you have to hit the mystery machine van and that will randomly select one of the cases and then it's like oh you pick this case and it's like okay in order to solve this case you need to hit these three doors but not these two other doors so it's like it's all about like okay we're going to set up series of targets that you have to specifically hit sometimes in a specific order not hit other targets so it's all about like literally directing your shots it's not just about keeping the ball in play it's also like you have to hit specific things sometimes in a specific order while still keeping the ball alive and that'll open up other areas or open up jackpots and like oh hit these seven things then you get the jackpot open and then you have to do that and it's complicated and it's kind of it's it, part of it is a little off-putting because it's very hard to understand what you're supposed to be doing while you're trying to keep the ball alive mm -hmm. but part of it is also i think a large part of it is appealing to me where i'm like I do want to like spend hours and hours on a single pinball game to like fully understand it and then get good at it. Like um, one of the machines I was playing this weekend was the Game of Thrones machine. And for some reason, I had like a 15 minute run on it. Like I was like just doing stuff and they were like they were like okay you got to go through this door and i like went through the door and i was like hitting all these shots perfectly and when you understand what's happening and you're kind of hitting the shots you're supposed to it feels fantastic so yeah like getting pinballs, into the zone yeah exactly so so pinball is really cool it's it's funny though because i'm like like will you like the godzilla machine but we were talking to the guy at morristown game vault when we did the documentary and it was, it was pretty funny but he started complaining about all the newer pinball machines and how they have an, like a color lcd screen and and he was like he was like don't include this in the documentary because i don't want i don't want the pinball people to get mad at me like bally and williams <laughs> which which makes sense because he has like i don't want to say deals but he has to have a relationship with them to get the newer machines you know mm -hmm. but he's literally like i don't like any of the screens on them like like have just a score number that's all i need and i was like I was like, OK, buddy, you know, he probably likes retro games. But the more I play pinball, the more I, I actually don't like those, those the ones that have a screen like we like one of them was was Deadpool, the pinball machine. And it had like probably a 14 or 16 inch color LCD screen. And it was showing like some fake 16 bit Deadpool game. And it was like like a side scrolling beat em up that was happening while you're trying to play the pinball game. And I'm just like this is too complicated. So it's, so it's weird. Like I'm starting to get into pinball, but I'm also becoming like one of those purists where I'm like, I don't need the color screen and I don't want too much going on. Like, like just give me like, like the eighties when it used to be good. So I, I'm not going to say I'm never going to buy a pinball machine. I, it's probably unlikely, but there's part of me that's like, okay, I could probably get rid of some of my stuff or save enough money. X, Y, Z ways that, It'll make it easier for me to be like, you know what? I can buy that pinball machine because I've done the savings worth. It's not extra money. It's just money I've adjusted. So maybe I'll buy one eventually. Um, but right now I'm just enjoying wherever I can. Whenever we visit somewhere, I'm always just like, hey, Google Maps, you got any pinball places around here? Because it's it's pretty fun. That's my, that's my little pinball adventure for now. This um, um this Game of Thrones machine is a lot it's a bad. It's I want it to be better. I want it to look cooler. I want it. Oh, I agree with you. I want yeah. it to look like the opening credits to Game of Thrones, where it has like the spinny houses and stuff. Like, take that motif yeah. and make like, because that's already like a pinball machine, and make that yeah. the pinball machine. And instead, it's They're, just uh, awful. Does it There's have a one. really, really disappointing ending? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there, there was one machine I played. I think it was called Medieval Madness, but it had it had a castle in the back left, and it had a moat. And so you were like literally like trying to hit the walls or or run the ball across the moat, the drawbridge as it was going up and down, like you're attacking the castle. And I got to a point where I did enough damage to it that the center towers, which was like four towers, but they were all foam to demonstrate it destroying. They just like started flipping and flopping around. Oh, so, so like cool. you, it, it felt like you were attacking a, a, a castle. Oh, and then that was also the one where at some point I unlocked like an ogre attack. So three ogres popped up their heads in the middle of the play field and I had to hit each of them. That's probably the one I should get. That one was really cool. 
Like, I like. why isn't there, like, a big ice wall, like, at the top of this, and you're, like, hitting it? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and they're like, oh, no, there's, you gotta go to the, yeah. Anyways, it could be a lot. It, it was, it was <laughs> weird, because the, the theme of it was basically, like, you had to pick your house, so you could pick one of the houses, and then you were, you were, like, getting supplies and building troops for battles against other houses. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna fight the night walkers i'm gonna go across the, the the northern wall or whatever it was literally just like oh hit this for supplies hit this for more troops okay now you're gonna go to battle pick your house it was it was like a weird pinball based on like logistics for a medieval battle it was, it was kind of weird now that i think about the way they decided to it theme was, that it was uh what is it crusader kings game of thrones pinball <laughs> It hearts of iron was, yeah no yeah, it was uh, hearts of iron yeah because it, re it really was like supplies oriented i was like the Euro europa universalis it's that that version yeah of it. it's wow wild that's wild uh great i'm happy you're you like playing with balls still uh you're a ball guy that's what we what we who, like to um, call who it. isn't these big days ball you know? big, big ball, ball guy. guy big ball me guy. big ball guy um yeah. kyle i want to learn about the game you've been playing because i keep misread <laughs> i misread it as love rim <laughs> and i was like i was like sure what like great license plate so um <laughs> please tell me about lore rim it's actually about it's a game about license plates so you spot on Damn. uh it's not um oh. wouldn't that be crazy though no uh so I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. I've heard it pronounced lower rim as if there's like a space in between it. And I've heard it pronounced lorem. So take that for what you will. Uh, but it's a, well, let me ask you a question. Have you guys ever heard of a little game called the Elder Scrolls five Skyrim? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. You think you, you think you guys have heard of that? Never heard um, of remember, remember how uh, they Bethesda, released like a thousand versions of it and all of them were exactly the same as the beginning just with some patches like the, yeah. the very first original one well modders stepped in as they normally do for bethesda releases and came up with a way of essentially <laughs> making skyrim what it should have been for all like the the whatever the latest version of that release that bethesda put out like they perfected it in so far as the visuals actually kind of make it look like the Witcher, like the Witcher uh -huh. three, like it looks really, it looks pretty good. Um, and it is a 300 gigabyte download because you have to use this program called Wabajack, which if you've played Elder Scrolls, you know what the Wabajack is. Um, and it's an auto mod downloader that uses like Nexus mods uh, and it, it sort of compiles everything in the right order so that everything loads properly. Uh, it's, interesting because it doesn't just visually redo skyrim it completely changes the combat it makes it more like dark souls or sekiro um where it's a lot more vicious and the leveling system has been completely redone um every kind of improvement that you can think of from textures to lighting there's volumetrics there's anti-aliasing like all the stuff that you kind of expect a normal release to have is there uh, and it kind of just works. There's different uh, performance profiles you can do. You can have like your hyper, like ridiculous overclocked computer build. You can have like a potato build and it will still pretty much run. It does have a certain amount of jank because you are, of course, building off of the creation engine, which is, you know, inherently unstable at this point. And uh, it 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 takes a little bit of finessing to get it to work. I actually had to go on the discord and I talked with a couple of the people who work uh help with patching it and the whole, the reason i i am even doing this is because i was looking for something to do that i had never done before which is diving into modding games i am the type of person who whatever game i'm presented with that's the game i play like i don't mm -hmm. i don't normally like to go around unless unless it's like oh you have to change a setting in an ini file or something I could uh -huh. do that. Like, that's fine. But I'm normally like whatever I get, that's what I'm playing. Whatever's on the disc or whatever I download from Steam, I don't want to touch it too much. And I had this this sort of itch to go back and play and play an Elder Scrolls game. And I was like, well, I'll just do Skyrim again because it's been like 10 years since I've touched it. And I <laughs> I installed it from Steam. It's like a 15 gigabyte download. And I was like, this looks really bad. 
Like it looks like way worse than I remember it looking. And so I started looking around. I, I went on Nexus mods and I was like, okay, well, let me try and download some mods myself. And I started getting into the thing where it's like, well, this one doesn't work with this one. There, there's different like um, there's different versions of like Skyrim that if you have the base profile, certain mods won't work with them. It's it's a mess. But I found that there are these configurators like Wabajack that people have created solely uh -huh. for the purpose of just improving the game. And they're not like it's all free, like nothing, nothing is paid. Um, I did pay for the Nexus mod premium so that I could download everything faster and I didn't have to wait like a week. But uh -huh. that was the only that's the only sort of money that I put into this. And so far, it's I, I might actually like want to stream it after we after we get through Spooky Pixel. It's really interesting. It's not perfect but it's it's almost like playing skyrim for the first time again with yeah. a huge amount of quality of, of life improvements and just a general sense of like hey this isn't just the same game like we've added uh community uh mods and quests uh you can go visit one of the lands in morrowind uh the, that they, they yeah. like added in and stuff like that it's great and it looks really good there's all these um, ENB files that come with the the Wabajack download where you can actually pick and choose like what kind of atmosphere you want. Like if you want a more um, Nordic style or you want like a more classically like medieval style or, or even just a different lighting setup entirely, there's these ENB files. And it I, I love the versatility of it. And I am sort of I've become enraptured with like going around and not even doing the main quest, but just looking at like, how different does this game look and feel? And by and large, it's pretty incredible. Again, it's not perfect. There's like a bunch of weird things that happen. Like if you die, it will use like a like a Dark Souls thing where it's like the last place you slept or the last place you were at a campfire, I think it will re re reinstance you at that place. Um, but it's just very it's very clunky when you die like it pauses the game and you have to like click to like unpause it and sometimes the camera will get all fucked up but other than that i haven't had a single crash like which i can't say for the original skyrim which is kind of amazing and uh i i'm really like interested in it and i think this might actually become the topic of a new video that i want to do which is looking more at the modding scene specifically to skyrim because it is so it's so built up at this point. There's so many people doing yeah. so many different mods and it it is it has outlived the life of Skyrim because people people love being able to go in and customize the game how they want it to how they want it to look and feel and adding content. And there's something about that for, for me is just inherently interesting. So that's Lorem. Uh, I mean, I would suggest checking it out, but it does take a while to download. And, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it's not for everyone, but it's cool. I like it. Yeah, it sounds very similar to um, what I did with with uh, Back to New Vegas, which was I I knew there was a lot of mods and stuff. So there's a big mod pack called Viva New Vegas that kind of, mm. like you said, just kind of pulls it all together. It's not I don't want to say it's not that it's not drastically changing the game, but it's kind of like, hey, you're playing the original game. Yeah, it just doesn't feel like the original game. It feels like how you remember it playing. So yeah. a lot of quality of life stuff like I remember I. I was playing Fallout New Vegas, the Viva New Vegas, and I was sprinting and then Will was watching and he was like, how are you sprinting? And like, I didn't even realize it was a mod that let me sprint or like the quicker looting systems. It just falls right into place. You know, this this has one of those exact same things. And I experienced it the first time I played um, Lorem is you can in the original Skyrim, you can't run and jump. You, you have to oh, be yeah, standing it's, it's still and jump, or, yeah and the this mod just changes that and i remember like one that was one of the things where i i started up the original and i played through and i was like this doesn't feel very good and immediately i noticed like i can move faster just because i can run and jump at the same time and it's like little yeah. tiny touches like that but at it, it the the entire mod list is like 3600 mods it's it's wow massive Damn. it's huge um and it, it it's really really interesting they've completely overhauled like the the vampire like evolution and leveling system they've added a dedicated like destiny um not destiny the game but like it's like a pathing uh level system uh -huh. that's that's aside from the actual like numbered leveling system really really interesting stuff so oh they also added um you can dodge now there's like a whole invasion uh, or oh, evasion cool. skill tree it's 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 pretty cool but yeah is there a nudity mod 
Yes, there is. Hell yeah. It is not it is not included, but like obviously Fuck if you go off. on if if you go on if you go on Nexus mods and just look at popular, like all the the adult stuff pops up. And within Wabajack, the first thing you do is you build your character. And if you go all the way to the right in like the menu selector, it does say genitals. But when I click it, nothing comes up because I think I haven't installed that mod. I do know what it's called, though. Do you want to know what that that specific mod is called oh, for please. for the for male enhancement? Schlongs of Skyrim. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, good. Yeah, it's pretty good. good. Hell yeah. yeah. Got dragons <laughs> back in Skyrim. Uh, that sounds awesome. I've been wanting to do that for a while. I um, I still raw dog Oblivion every so often because it's it's mm. such a perfect game. Uh, but I've thought about trying some mods for that game and seeing like what people have added. I know um, I have a bookmark. Do you guys do the thing that I do, which you probably do? This is probably like a, a you're a redneck, um, which on your uh browser on your phone you just leave tabs open of things you want to remember Does sometimes yeah yeah i have like one hundred and fifty thousand yeah. tabs on here oh but i anyways, have i'll have like two at the most so there's 34 that this is currently hidden um and it's Ouch. funny because on the computer i'm like a minimal tab guy but on my phone it's like i don't even have to care about it but anyways there was a some giant russian mod for it was either it sky oblivion no, it is um it is a Russian Oblivion mod called Citadel of Madness was finally oh. translated in July of this year into English. And you just reminded me of that. Um and yes, I do, do still have the tab open. Um and I want to go check that out. Um the other game I've always wanted to go back to is also Morrowind, which I think is too old for me to like if I had time as a young person, younger person, I think I would be able to do Morrowind raw, but I think I got to see if there's like some sort of at least quest markers or quest tracker because that game yeah. is, specifically that game is a check your notebook, read it and discern what it wants you to do uh well, be, sort of because thing. i've been because i've been looking up all this stuff about like how to install these mods and youtube has sort of changed what it's feeding me as far as what it thinks i'm interested in and i just got a video today that i watched while i was cleaning my apartment of a guy who went back and did exactly that he played just raw morrowind on on his pc and he had a quest at one point where a khajiit came up to him and said like hey me and my my group of people were looking to like kill this person and they literally said nothing about the person other than this is a person that we are interested in and he was like i don't i don't know where to find this person and it took him two hours of going around <laughs> and asking every npc in the city until he found like a, a glimpse of a hint and he was like it's so frustrating it's like going back to that and it's really yeah. funny how we went from like quest markers making things easy to like that which f for the time and and for certain people like that's incredible like you don't yeah. get to just find this person you got to go find them you're living your life in morrowind to now we are groaning at that because that is just like every game can do that now like that's that's yeah. not even a highlight anymore that's just an annoying thing <laughs> that you'd have to deal with so I just realized um, you have the Oblivion uh, oh, disc behind you. Yeah. I got that when Ian was visiting. We went to Digital Press, and they had that for oh, 20 nice. bucks. Uh, and it still has the coin, too. I was very surprised. I um, That's so cool. I think I don't think there's any other Oblivion stuff I, I don't own now that I think about it. So Morrowind, not to, not to I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but um, my first experience with Elder Scrolls was watching my friend play Morrowind on the original Xbox. And that quest that is at the beginning where the guy falls out of the sky. Yeah. Um, like I, that was like the first, I had, I, that was when my mind was like, I've never played a game like this before. Like, this is crazy. I think I was like 10 or nine or something like that and it was it was cool i've never played it though i've never i've never gone back and and tried it so it would be interesting it's, maybe it's fun i've gone back a few times i played it a lot it's the first video game i ever bought myself at the eb games nice. at the cape cod mall i purchased it i immediately took it out of the bag and walked around with it my mom yelled at me because she didn't want people to think i stole it um which mm. okay sure um and then in the car ride home i remember just staring there's like a one of the 
Morrowind guys on the back with like a, this headdress, and I remember staring at that. And then when I played the game, I literally just stole from everyone in the in everywhere. Just stole things. <laughs> I stood. There's the guy at the beginning, like Cadius something. I don't know if it's him, but there's the like guard of the town that you start in, and I hmm. stood on the table and I just punched him to death um, <laughs> because he couldn't reach you. <laughs> And then you have to, the very first quest you have is to deliver this package to, I think that's Cadius in, in, uh, like Vivek or something. And, uh, I went and killed him and it says like the threads of time, the threads of destiny have been unraveled because you like killed the main character. And, uh, I was like, okay, fuck it. And I uh, just kept playing. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to tell my friends, we had like a joke about the house of earthly delights which is a strip club, I guess, in Morrowind. Uh, and I we used to joke that it's not a... We'd say, oh, let's head on down to the, the um, Earthly Delights. It's not a bakery. Uh, because <laughs> for some reason we thought it sounded like a bakery. Um, you, should have, I, you should have put that on your wedding invitation. I that's, should have that's put where that we had on to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love Morrowind, despite not playing it very much. And I absolutely love Oblivion. Skyrim... Oh, Skyrim. You're Skyrim. Um, I think Sky Skyrim was my Oblivion, and I had I played Oblivion after. Mm -hmm. So just having that kind of like difference of like uh approaching a game from from a different perspective of like, oh, I've played this one, I haven't played this one, and it's older. So I don't know, it just didn't hit the same. And Skyrim was like that was like the moment in like 2011 or whenever it came out. Like I was in college. Yeah. I, I had pre-ordered it. We went to a GameStop in Nicholasville, Kentucky when I was at college. All the people in my dorm got copies, but only half the people had 360s, so we had to swap out like who was playing at whatever time, and it was it was great. Oh, all those was loading screens are also burned into my brain. <laughs> all yeah. of the Sony... Uh, you used to, <laughs> folks, you used to have to wait for video games to load, and it sucked. Imagine. Um, and you didn't have phones to look at. You just had the screen to look at. Uh, <laughs> Cart-based video games should have stayed around. Um, I have been playing video games this week. Uh, I have been playing more Yakuza 7. Uh, I played some today. I played a little earlier this week. I am in Yokohama now. Which uh, one is this? This is L y Yakuza Like a Dragon. It's like, the seventh like one. Okay. Um and it's funny because that new TV show coming out is called Like a Dragon Yakuza. Um, <laughs> it's the weird crossover <laughs> point. Uh, and it's really fun. I am in Yokohama. I, I have an apartment in a brothel now, which is great. Yeah. I have an ex-cop and, and a homeless, previously homeless guy uh, on my team who does things like uh, just stinky breath to lower people's defenses. I'm now at the what? point where enemies uh, turn, like transform into like swords and shields but it's bats and trash can lids uh because um as some people or people who've played the game know uh uh ichiban the the uh main character is obsessed with dragon quest which he played when he was younger and he is the hero now that's what he wants to grow up to be is still a hero and uh he views everything that way earning xp and all that sort of stuff and also everyone encourages that it's very nice people don't talk down to yeah. him about it they're like hey whatever gets you through it um people are very kind um i haven't advanced the story yet because i've been doing all the little missions in the first area i'm helping a homeless man build a shelf for a boy he's friends with i don't know why he's friends with the boy it's kind of weird <laughs> um they kind of glaze over it uh but i try not to ask too many questions uh it's not my culture um but it's really fun and uh it's it's great to just sit down for a bit and uh kind of it, it the thing i love about it in this day and age is you can't look away from the screen it's in Japanese. You got to read everything. You have to pay attention to everything. And I've noticed, like, I'm trying now to really distinguish voices because I don't know if that's like a typical uh -huh. thing, but just like similar voices, especially in other languages, I have hard hard time discerning yeah. discerning because I feel like you're not quite actually listening to them talking. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to be better about that. But it's a really fun game. Feels really good. Uh, and all the combat's great, uh, the the stuff like that. So it's fun. Uh, the other Which, game I've been playing. Oh, sorry, go for it. No, I was gonna, so I have. I think this was actually an Ian Gibson recommendation that I followed through on. Yakuza Zero 
Did you play that that's, one, that, Ian? Yes. That's the best one. That's the best okay. one by far. Yeah. yeah. So I downloaded that when it was on sale on Steam, and I still have not touched it. What, like, when did that one come out? Like, is that came out before Like a Dragon, or was that Well, after? so the short, short answer is it, it came out in, like, 2016, 2017-ish, mm. but it's technically a prequel to everything else. So, so okay. the good way to think about it is, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but it feels like this came out more than a decade and a half after the series had started, but it feels like a, like a tailor made entry point basically. Oh, okay. Uh, Cause it's introducing you to a lot of the main characters, the main setting, how Yakuza games play, but it plays really well. The story's great and has a lot of quality of life enhancements, et cetera. So it's, that's why for a lot of people, myself included, it's like Yakuza zero. You're basically getting in later in the series, but because it's a prequel, you don't have to know anything about story, et cetera. It's 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 a perfect, perfect starting point. Jumping on. And then from. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, because Yakuza Zero was kind of what kickstarted. I don't want to say kickstarted, but it's what it really is driving the recent popularity wave in the West of Yakuza. From there, you can choose. Do you want to go like a dragon route? Do you want to go Kiwami, which in Kiwami 2, which are remakes of one and two mm. in the Yakuza Ishii. Zero engine, et cetera? Yeah. But yeah, Yakuza Zero is fantastic. That's the definitely yeah. the best one to start with. It's probably, cool. I, I, and I don't say this lightly. It's one of the best games of all time that I that I have yeah. played. And really? Probably, yeah. It is. It is. It is. Wow. It is up there with Oblivion. It is. Where, where was fantastic. it? Fantastic. I think it was number two on our list. Something when we like started that. this podcast, and we ended up with like what the top fifty games. <laughs> I think of all Factorio time. is still number one. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course be. yakuza zero oh uh, if i could wipe my brain that's one that's on the list um i i really would if uh, if i had the time i would go play like one through and then well, yeah one through six um if i ever have time i think i would do that i would love to like chip away at those slowly because even though i know they aren't as like perfect as zero the other ones but i think um, I think it was Alex Navarro talking about just how like nice the story is to go through and like you yeah. learn about these characters across these games. Uh, yeah. and, and, and also, and, and it's not like, it's not like they're worse. They're just, the highs are not as high, but the, yeah. the basic game is still there. Still as exciting. Still much, still as much stuff to do, et cetera. And cool. seven is like a, is it's completely unrelated to the previous story, right? Uh, or it mostly. has like one or two tiny tie-ins but yeah it's brand new main character brand new side characters brand new location and it switches from action to to rpg to turn-based mm -hmm. rpg um so yeah I, i'm really 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 loving it um and then tcg card shop simulator uh i watched a streamer play this and then i was like ah, i could play that uh you are opening a trading card game shop uh you start in a tiny little shop you order cards you sell cards uh, you open cards and then you sell singles and you make tons of money and it's it just sounds like your life and extremely fun yeah, except it costs zero dollars um i am running a healthy business called card pixel uh we get a lot of people in every day i have a lot of play tables a lot of area room for expansion i order tons of shit uh you're supposed to throw away your boxes uh, in the trash can but i throw them all outside and they have Yet to crash the game. <laughs> There's a lot there. of boxes That's great. out there. Uh, great. People come from all over. You, uh, they like put stuff on the counter. You got to scan it all. They'll hand you the money. You give them change. All of my stuff is rounded to the nearest dollar, so I don't have to deal with change. <laughs> oh, um, it's, it's great. I do. That's I click on the item. I do plus ten percent, plus ten percent round, and then. Uh, <laughs> It's great. Some people pay an exact change. God. There's a credit card machine. You can use your numpad for that. People were uh, on forums and in, in the internet were talking about like, oh, you can add a mod that like auto updates the prices, turns the lights on at 4 p.m., uh, does the credit card machine <laughs> automatically for you. I'm like, you don't understand the fucking point of this game? It's like, I, I'm working here. What do you mean? What am I going to do if the, if the mods are doing everything for God. me? Um, it's really fun. I hit a $1,000 card. Or like a fifteen hundred dollar card, and I sold it for sixteen hundred. Ah, oh, that's fucking sucker! It's a digital card, idiot. I, so is this is this game good though? Because I I do kind of want to play it. It is twelve dollars <laughs> good, a thousand percent. Because it is okay. only twelve. Yeah. Or it's twelve nine eleven nine. Yeah, it is fun. It is in 
early access. It's like on build point four zero. Um, and so far, okay, I'm just having you. a good time. It's 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 a good podcasting game. Uh, and it's just like I don't know. I I find fun stocking the shelves, being like, oh, I'll, let me put some shelves over here. And if I if I expand a little bit, I'll add all the tables here. There's also stinky people who come in, and you gotta spray them down uh, to make sure <laughs> that they. What? People who play at TCG <laughs> card places, they I mean, tell you the I've, stereotype I've them, about I'm people just, stinking. Yeah. <laughs> I have been in that situation before, and it reeked. Um, it's just funny that both games you listed involve a stinky oh, uh, that's feature. True. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But one of them, well, I guess it does lower my defense in this game. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I said, all the Pokemon, Pokemon, all the card things, whatever they're called, I don't actually remember, are really cute. There's different card packs um yeah it's fun uh that's tcg card shop simulator it's like 12 bucks on steam highly recommend it uh to waste a couple hours especially if you want to just open card you just i just when there's no customers i walk over the shelf take a bunch of card packs and just sit there at high speed and open them all up and you can set it to be like show me all the new cards and then show me the ones that are worth money and then all the cards that aren't worth money i can bundle into these packs and then i sell those packs for 10 bucks a pop and people buy those because they're under market price um, suckers and yeah it's Jeez. great uh it's, and i want to hire my first uh, the first guy you can hire i haven't done it yet but uh they're like slow but then you don't have to like man the checkout counter you can like work on other stuff so you could just call them disabled it's okay <laughs> no they're not like they're sh- <laughs> 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 Oh, sorry. You can hire a disabled man. Um, <laughs> That's a uh, mod. That's yeah, yeah. It's a mod. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ian uh, Gibson, have are you playing right now? Question: Are you playing right now? I I am not playing Velatro Mobile right now. Um, yes, I've been playing Velatro Mobile. It was kind of perfect. It came out the day before my trip last weekend. Um, and. Uh, I've talked about this before, but I always look for good phone games when I'm taking a flight because one of my favorite activities on a flight is play a phone game and listen to my podcast. Like, it's just perfect. Uh, Shout out to Konami Pitcross, the OG. So good. So good. (laughs) Um, So good. So incredible. Um, Yeah, so Bellatro came out on the mobile. I've been playing it. Uh, it's basically the PC game. It does kind of suck that you can't carry your save over because you do kind of unlock stuff and keep going. But the core game is still there. It's pretty pretty much the same. The only thing is, and maybe Will, you can help me. In in the mobile version, when you buy a card, you have to like click and hold the card and drag it to like a buy area. Is it is it like that on the PC version as well? No, you just like click you just on click it to and buy it. Buy it. Yeah, and it goes up there. Yeah. So as far as I can tell, that's kind of the only change, which is smart. Like if you click and hold on it, it'll pop the the hover for the card, telling you what the card is and what it means. So so because of that, you have to click, hold and drag it to an area to buy it or sell it or use it, which is nice. Um, I, part of me does wish that it's still horizontal, though. I do kind of wish they had made it vertical or have a vertical option so that you can play it more one handed. Um it's not it's not really a one handed game because you got to hold the phone sideways. So you got to hold it with one hand and stab it with the other, whereas I, I would kind of like to be able to do it one handed in some situations. But, yeah, it's pretty much Palacho. It's mobile. I think it's 10 bucks or something like that. It's great. Um, the other game I've been playing is Laszlo, also known as The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom <laughs> based on. <laughs> I was sitting here, oh, for so long. Trying to figure it out. It. Because there's like that Did, H- TLOZ didn't give it to you? I, no. I, yeah, that instantly. I kept singing Zhao. And I was thinking yeah. like a, a sleeping cat saying meow would be Zhao. Um, yeah. So anyways. I'm guessing neither of you are have, have picked up this game and, and started playing it. <laughs> I do not have time. Uh, I've heard very good things about it. Is that is that true? Or are you Are you enjoying it? Uh, I'm only about an hour. I'm, I'm only in about an hour in. You do play as a female character. Uh, thanks, DEI. Um, what's what's that? What's that company's name? Sweet Baby Sweet Rays? Baby. <laughs> sweet, sweet Baby, baby Rays. Rays. <laughs> Goddamn Sweet Baby Rays. You really <laughs> got their video games. sauce all over Nintendo. Um, yeah, so it's 
it's a little weird. So so this is technically a mainline Zelda game. They said that. Um, but you play as Princess Zelda. Um, it is more of a it's not necessarily a 2D game because it does have 3D elements to it, but it's they're basically embracing the Link's Awakening remake style where it's a bit more chibi. You have the angle. It's like 2D, 3D. Um, this is really just a puzzle game, though. Like there is combat, but um, this isn't really a spoiler because, again, I'm only an hour in. But you you do eventually unlock the ability to turn into Link for short periods of time to do Link combat, like swing your sword, do the power up circle and then hold your shield. But a majority of the time you are just Zelda. And the whole gimmick is that certain items in the world, like a bed uh, or a trampoline or a pot, you can go up, take an echo of it. And then based on the mana cost of it, you can spawn multiple copies of that throughout the world. Um, so, for example, you start out with three. I'm going to call it mana cost. That's the easiest way to think of it. You start out with three mana in your pool and a bed costs one mana. So I can spawn three of them. If I spawn another one, the first one goes away and I can also get rid of all of them at the same time if I wanted to. When you defeat an enemy, you can also take an, an echo of that enemy and then spawn them in and they fight for you and you can target them to specific people, which is which is pretty cool because I had a really good moment where, you know, this is largely a I don't want to call it a non combat game, but you're kind of like a non combatant. Right. Mm. Um, and I came across um, a spear moblin, so a little spear piggy guy and he's throwing spears. And if I was Link, you know, I would just be like, OK, let me just, you know, whack him a couple times, be a little careful and he's done. But now I'm like, I'm like Zelda and I'm like, oh, oh shit, like he's going to do damage to me. What am I supposed to do here? And I was able to take him out with like some snakes or whatever that I had. And I was like, oh, that was quite a fight. Like, is it going to be like that every time? But then I realized I took an echo of him. So now every time I face off against one of those guys, I can just throw a throw one right back in their face. You know, so it has this like weird sense of progression to it where it's like once you defeat an enemy, you just get a copy of them, you know, and depending on the mana cost. Now I can spawn multiples of them. So it's like it's like the first time I defeated a spider, I took a copy of the spider. And now if I come across other spiders, I can just be like, well, fuck you. Here's three spiders, you know, just like <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Um, That's great. And then there's also a mechanic that I just unlocked where I, certain objects I can Actually, I don't even think it's certain objects. It feels like a lot of objects I can pick up and move, but not as myself, like pick up almost in a magic way. So I can pick up like a giant boulder rock and move it. But that being said, it's it's basically just using that to present a series of incredibly simplistic puzzles. Like even the side puzzles to get to chest are not that difficult. And, and again, I'm only an hour in, but it feels a lot like Captain Toad where Captain Toad is all about like, hey, how do you progress through the space and use objects and positioning to platform your way through it? Um, but Captain Toad has such like a sense of like wonder and awe and playfulness to it where this does not have that level. So it mm -hmm. feels like I'm just going through Zelda dungeons where they've stripped all the combat out and just left in like the really fucking basic like platform move object puzzles. So I, I think I'm going to keep playing it. But so far, it's pretty disappointing, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, mm. I don't think it's bad. It just I, I'm going to say this. This is going to sound like the generic cliche against Nintendo. And I don't mean it in that way whatsoever. But it really does feel like a children's game. It feels like that Kirby game that play, came out last year where there is just there's not really any challenge in this, you know, and it sucks because the mechanics that they've introduced uh, they do work and there is like a little bit of, you know, uh, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom physics in here. Like, for example, I came across a bunch of crates and I was like, well, there's a couple ways I can deal with these crates. But instead, I just threw a fire enemy at them and they lit on fire and it burned the crates down. And I'm like, cool, mm -hmm. like there's physics stuff like that. Right. But it just doesn't feel like I need to fucking do any of that. Like there's a. There's a meta going around where people are like, hey, the most powerful item in this game is a block of water. Like you just take an echo of a block of water, you put it down and then you grab an enemy and you put them in the block of water and they immediately drown like all the enemies. <laughs> and so it's like and you hear that and you go, oh, that's really cool. But then you play the game and you go, that doesn't feel satisfying. 
Like, it doesn't feel like I'm getting one over on the game. It feels like there are these puzzles where you're not finding necessarily the solution. You suddenly have a million different ways to solve it, and therefore none of them feel satisfying. <laughs> so it's mm. it feels like a miss so far. I, I think I will keep playing it. I'm not ready to give up on it yet, but it just feels like a cutesy Zelda game. But then they stripped out any of the like innovative or really good feeling gameplay to it. So it's like. Yeah, a little disappointing, um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes as I keep playing it. But yeah, that's what I've been playing. Gotcha. Yeah, I was looking up Brad. I think it was Brad on Next Lander. I mentioned that they still do those like ask the developer interviews. And there was one on the echoes of of whatever wisdom uh talking about how they originally wanted link to be the protagonist but there was like you early tests like no one would engage with the echo stuff because you have a sword and shield you're just killing things yeah and i, and I do that is the one part that excites me like you saying like oh i only have to defeat this enemy once and then i can clone them and like use yeah. them to kill them like that's my favorite type of progression in games when it r gets rid of the thing you had to do before um, yeah, I feel like that's why Minecraft always feels so good because you don't ever have to really go backwards, you know? Um, mm, yeah. And I this isn't I don't mean to pop your balloon, but there's there's kind of two things that are counter to your excitement. Um, one is, like I said, they give you they let you transform into Link and you have a little energy meter and it, it burns. I don't know how long it lasts, but it does burn and doesn't recharge automatically. You have to find things to recharge it. But like the fact that you can get into these situations where you're just like, oh, I could try and solve this or defeat this enemy mm -hmm. or I could just turn into Link and, and slash things. It's like, again, I haven't played a lot of the game, but it feels like when that happened and I realized what they were letting you do, I was like, fucking why? <laughs> like you just you just shot yourselves in the foot. Like uh, there's so much stuff that I, I'm just going to be like, yeah, I'll just go to Link instead of forcing me to engage with this new mechanic. Um, and then the second thing. Oh, yeah, the second thing, this is a little harder to describe, but what you're describing, like the excitement about like, oh, I'm going to place this here and see what happens and stuff that would work really well in a sandbox game where like there's lots of enemies or like different situations or you can go explore. You can really break out of the box. But this is this really feels like a screen based game, you know, where it's like. I am it's not literally like this, but, you know, like the 8 bit and 16 bit area where it's like I'm going into a screen. This is the area. There are two enemies here. I just need to deal with them. Cool. Mm. Now through the doorway. And when you do that and every situation is extremely limited and it's a how do you get up on this ledge? How do you get over here? How do you defeat this enemy? But that's it. There's not a lot of room for experimentation. It's like, why would I experiment when I know I can just spawn three snakes and they'll take care of them and as soon as the sn one snake dies i immediately spawn another one like i i think they just made it this thing where they're trying to give you all these options but there's nothing actually challenging you and there's not enough space for you to experiment so everything just feels like a wave of your hand you're just like yeah whatever okay there we go yeah that worked whatever yeah whatever and you're just kind of going through it it just doesn't feel like there's any sort of challenge or excitement or discovery in this which is upsetting do you think that'll change as you go through it or uh, how how far into it are you again uh, i'm about an hour hour and a half i would say i, f I feel like you got to give it at least well how how much more are you uh, let willing me put it to this give way it? i have i have like 30 echoes right now uh -huh. of, of different things like a trampoline stone like i've got a bunch of stuff i've probably got 10 different enemies i've seen I've, i'm in the middle of the first oh i'm towards the end of the first dungeon so I, i'm not giving up on it but i i do feel like i have pretty much seen what the game is going to offer i don't feel like i'm in a tutorial area where they are deliberately limiting things i've already gone through that gotcha. so i i am going to keep playing it but i I don't see them drastically fixing a lot of the problems that I have with it. Mm. This uh, okay. this sounds like a Switch Two game for me. Yeah. So yeah, I could see that. So we'll see. Uh, well, I'm glad you're playing. I I, for, I totally forgot I was out. I'm I'm also saving. I do have a I got a a Nintendo Store gift card for my birthday, and I was thinking of using it, but I am saving that for Mario Party Jamboree. 
uh, yes. which they announced there's a pro mode in that game that gets rid of like it's it gets rid of all the luck based games in like a fuck a, off a, 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 and that's a Mario run, Party. and then I think it gets rid of some of the other stuff. So I'm I'm very excited for that as well. Um, let's hope they learn their lesson from Super Mario Party because that that game was uh, annoying um, to say the least. Wait, Speaking was of Super annoying, Mario Party the last one. Uh, yeah, sorry. So Super Mario Party, and now this is Super Mario Party Jamboree. They're of the same ilk. The technically the last Mario Party was Superstars, but that is not. It's not part of this line of. If, of oh, but Super Superstars was good. Right? Superstars was fantastic. Yes, Superstars was okay, good. It was you. just remakes of the previous ones. This is a yeah. different type of Mario Party because you get like the ally dice and everything, um, which like, I'm hoping like they like a main that line. Event. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, speaking of mainlining, uh, Ian Gibson, give me the news. Do, 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 yeah. Do. Uh, let's start with the games news. We got three games announcements this week. Number one, a set of Corsa Evo uh, has been announced on Steam. So a set of Corsa is a uh, racing simulator. It's a little bit more community focused. And we talked about bots earlier. It's got a big mod scene. Um, it's very popular. If you want to be super serious sim racer, you play iRacing. If you want to be a little bit more fun, but still have realistic cars, you play a set of Corsa. So we've got a sequel announced there. We've also got Avatar The Last Airbender is getting a AAA RPG from Saber Interactive. That's the Space Marine 2 studio. And we also have, um, this is the second time I've seen this. I don't remember them ever officially announcing this, but Ubisoft Massive is hiring for the Division 3. They are making a third Division game. Uh, how do you guys feel about these games? Any of these really got you excited? Don't care at all about the division. Uh, a set of Corso. I did check it out when you added the link in. It looks cool. I have not played a driving game in a really long time. So if you're telling me this is a little bit more like friendly than like iRacing. Oh, it's not. It's not. Oh, I thought you said it. I thought you Sorry. said it was. I thought you said it was. Well, iRacing was for more less... professional stuff. Let me put it this way. And, and the reason why I bring this up is because, Will, this is something we should do now that you're into initial D and you have a wheel and pedals. I uh, I racing is literally like I racing has penalty systems for you, like driving into people and and it's like matchmaking. It's got heavy mm. skill base. So it's all like you are here to drive. There's a little bit of you can have a little bit of fun, but most of the time it's like you're here to drive and be serious. Assetto Corsa, the same sim platform, basically, where it's like very realistic cars. They're hard to drive, et cetera. But there's a lot of community servers so uh, a lot of the popular community servers are like, hey, here's Tokyo Expressway with a lot of traffic. Let's just kind of drive that in cars. Um, one of the other ones is uh, Toge, where it's just, hey, here's a Japanese mountainside and we're just going to do a bunch of drifting up and down the mountainside. So it's it's not friendly in terms of mechanics. Like you are going to have to learn how to drive a sim car, yeah, which is not no. necessarily easy. But that's what I was that's what I was assuming. I it's just yeah. more like the player base is more like, hey, we're not like sweaty. Yes. 100 percent right. of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more like community lobby ish as yeah. opposed to matchmaking. Yeah. But it is it is still going to be. It's much more difficult than Gran Turismo or Forza and that it's not forgiving mm -hmm. with assist, etc. But will we should we should do some initial D drifting in a set of course. I am. I don't want to show anyone up, you know, I'm really good. Really good. I don't I was know how to some drift. Burnout take down today hard. on the PlayStation 2. I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Oh, man. Drifting's hard, though. It'd be fun to learn how to drift. Um, Division 3. Well, we're big division heads. We love to divide. What do we want out of Division 3? <laughs> I want uh, I want winter again uh, because that yeah. was a great setting. I... I Desperately want New York setting? City again, but I, it, I like I would take like a San Francisco. Cisco, San Francisco would be cool. Or for once in the yeah. life of a video game, a uh, city n not in America would be fun. I was going to um, do London or like Berlin. Ooh, London would be cool. Or like Hong Kong would be uh, yeah, pretty Hong fun. Kong. Singapore. Like Sleeping Dogs. Singapore. 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 Oh, that's a great idea. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. I... I, what, it was yeah division two just wasn't good and i can't remember why division one was pretty fun i, I like division I, one i think i think if i may i think it's because 
Division one was unique. It wasn't necessarily amazing, but the way that you progressed and the way the combat felt and the way you moved was unique. But the problem was, if you remember, Division one ran out of content. <laughs> like, like we played Division <laughs> one and we just got through it and then we were like, OK, that's it. I don't know if I played Division one with you. I think I played with somebody else. And then Division two came out. And I think the problem with Division two was it was the same. It was a different city, but it felt the same. They didn't quite have enough end game content. And so it was like it was just more of the same. So I think for Division three, I need them to really do things differently. I need them to really bring in like a lot more skills, a better progression path, like actually give me some end game as opposed to like I've hit level cap. That's all there is with this, you know? Uh, yeah. And 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 for what it's for what I, whatever this means, one felt a little more like science fiction-y than two yeah. felt too grounded it was too like 2016 <sighs> paramilitary was in dc, DC. It, was in yep. DC. it was in dc and, yeah. and your, your your home base was in the white house because you're trying to reestablish yeah. the chain of command that's for the so government. ridiculous and, yeah. and one was like the dollar flu and they were like the crazy guys who lit themselves on fire there was the rikers yeah. island guy like that felt like a spider-man game without spider-man and you were just like yeah. defending the city so that was that was the other big thing and, and yeah something about it just being in the daytime like it didn't feel like apocalypsy at all um so i kind of yeah. i would i would love that and, and I, of course i want agent ryan titular agent ryan of division it's fame president president ryan president uh um i remember playing division one and we unlocked after doing like a bunch of missions we unlocked the ultimate prize which was agent ryan's jacket and me and my three friends went who <laughs> like we had no idea who the fuck they were talking about so i always like to bring up agent ryan um but yeah i after playing star wars outlaws like their engine is is there like snow engine is nothing yeah snowdrop is nothing we have to to uh worry about everything's good on that front and it, it's 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 ready for the just like nail the story and stuff this time uh, and kind of kind of get down to it. So, um, yeah, I, I think I for like... me, number one thing is, honestly, I think it's got to be free to play because I'm I pay for Division one. I'm OK with that. I pay for Division two because for whatever reason, Will and I were just like, yeah, let's play this. Let's stream this. <laughs> and we did for a bit, but I'm not going to I don't want to make that mistake, but I don't think Division three is going to be that different. In which case, it's got to be free to play. Like, just get me in there. There's all sorts of other monetizations you can do. And that'll encourage you. Again, their problem was content treadmill. I think if they make it free to play and lean into the, the games as a service, they're going to have to set that treadmill up. Yeah. And this is the perfect free to play game. They, they really should that, lean into it with this one. That was sort of the problem is Division 1 felt like a game you could buy and just play. And Division mm. 2 felt less like that. It felt more like Destiny 2, where they're like, hey, we're, we're going to be supporting this for years, sort of thing. And then yeah. now I'm like, either I want them to do the Division 1 thing again, where it's like, hey, here's the full fucking game. It's it's packed out to the gills. Or, hey, it's free to play. We're going to be doing it this way, sort of thing. Um, because I, I like... Uh... I did not realize you guys were such division heads. Yeah, like, D heads. It's yeah. it's like it's like the perfect example of we're not, but it was just both times they came out, it was like the right time, right moment to be like, yeah, I could play this right now. Let's let's hang out and play this, you know. And and there's still a spot for that. It just needs to be free to play and be a little bit better than one and two, you know. Yeah. And division you guys one. You see the movie. Uh, yeah, oh, there is there is Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal there. and Jessica Chastain and someone else. If, I can't remember. Is he the fire Agent guys Ryan? Are in it? <laughs> I don't know. If the fire guys are in it, hell yeah. Yeah, Doll I, I also think like... it's like it's it's the first game they're adapting, oh. right? Yeah, but they may not do the fire. So I can't remember the the backs. The fire guys were firemen. Yeah, something that like that. Crazy? There's the dollar flu, which I always thought was cool. Like they they like tainted a bunch of dollar bills. And that's why it like hit yeah. New York City because of all the commerce and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then yeah, there was the firefighter guys. There was wasn't there like a but, there, but oh so they were the cleaners. Just, that's what they were. Yeah, they were burning so, so, shit. 
to like get rid of the yes. virus. That's what it was. So they so they had enemies, but they weren't just generic enemies. There were factions, but then they had they had like personalities. So like Will was saying, like the cleaners were all like, oh, the only way we we work through this is we have to kill everybody else and kill the virus off. So they all had flamethrowers and they were in hazmat suits. So they really leaned into like, we're going to do some weird faction stuff and really build them out into unique enemies. And, and that's why I say they need to be in the in the movie. It's not a guarantee because if the movie is like something like, I don't know, fucking World War Z, where they're like, we're going to drastically change this to our own style and fuck it up in the process. They could easily be like, no, cleaners aren't realistic. That's too much of a video game thing. We're not going to do that. We're just going to have generic enemies. You know, mm. that's my concern with the, with the movie. Oh, so it was the Department of Sanitation employees who seek to purify whatever they deem infected. It was so they were the <laughs> yes. cleaners. There were the Rikers uh, who follow William Riker from Star Trek: The Next Generation, and also oh. uh, they escaped from Riker Island uh, and. Yeah, I think it was just those two were the big guys. I think they introduced a third one later on. But I forgot, like, there was, like, that main... So it was, like, Central Station, Grand Central was your, like, main base. And there was a guy... Yeah. It felt very lived in because there were always people talking. There was, like, that general hum that they piped in. And there was a guy who would play his guitar. And I actually ripped the files out of the game because the, like, guitar music was, like... It was like before lo-fi chill was such a big thing. So it was just like good to listen to while yeah. you were studying. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is Division. I got into it with my friends the like y the winter I moved to quote unquote New York City. So I was working in the city <laughs> and like it was winter and I was playing and I went and found my office building in the game. And uh, so you got a bunch of guns. I had a bunch of guns. Yeah. I purified the homeless people. Yeah. Yeah, remember they had, they, had good, they had good skills too. Like, because I remember they had this little, it was like a little briefcase gun, oh, but it was turret? also a turret. You could throw. So you would just, oh, it was, it was like a little so briefcase. Good. You would throw it out, and it would land somewhere and be a little yes. turret and live for like thirty seconds. Like, like there was actually a lot that they did well in that game, and it it was it was just a really good like, hey, we're gonna chill, looter shooter, play with some friends. Oh, I got this cool new gun oh okay this is cool like there was just enough there for you to keep coming back and enjoy it so i that's that's kind of why we're excited about this because they didn't fuck it up they just delivered like a solid seven out of ten eight out of ten yeah. there is definitely enough there for them to make an even better game here mm. i hope so way better um just to just to round out this the avatar thing um because we talked about the other two games it i mean cool i still feel like it's like 10 years too late and it's also just getting started like now. So we're not going to see anything yeah. for at least three, four years. And they just made That's that true. Avatar Far Cry game. So. Yeah, there's there's been like five Avatar games, too, and all of them are terrible. So what's yeah, the yeah. what's the burning the article Earth? says it has a, a mixed history with video <laughs> games. It's like, yeah, one of them was the 360 one. You could play to get a thousand gamer score in like five minutes. <laughs> and like. Pretty sure, I, <laughs> yeah. pretty sure I own a copy of it uh, because you literally like it was like it was like it was zero like in to the hundred tutorial hits. area. <laughs> like you just had to get yeah. a combo of like a hundred, yeah, in tutorial area. So it's a legacy right there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move on to the business journal. We we've got some three feel good stories here about brand new ventures. Uh, first up, the Vampire Survivors developer has opened a publishing arm basically hoping to focus on uh, other indie games and guide them to a similar level of success and uh, basically loudly decreeing uh, Web3 and free-to-play mobile games can stuff it, according to PC Gamer, basically saying, hey, we're going to focus on good indie games and not a lot of the current buzz trends. Devolver has basically launched a middleman business uh, whose sole purpose is to help indie developers make IP deals with Disney, Dark Horse Comics, Rebellion, Lionsgate, etc., to make games, indie games based off those IPs. So they talk about like uh, Hellboy, Web of Word, and John Wick Hex as examples of these are big IPs that have essentially been licensed to smaller indie games to make their own little things. So this is a uh, big fan games that's going to be kind of be a middleman there. And then Mario Plus Rabbids and Red Dead Redemption creators have formed a new st studio day for night. The big headline here, at least for me, is this is from uh, David Soliani, 
who is the crying bearded man who created Mario plus rabbits. If you remember, he left Ubisoft recently. This is the studio that he's starting. It's also going to be led by Christian uh, Cantamessa, who has Red Dead Redemption, Shadow of Mordor and Perfect Dark in their history. So the original re- Perfect Dark. I, I, that's what it looks like. So I'll, I'll wow. read the five here that between the two of them. Uh, their press release says Red Dead Redemption, Shadow of Mordor, Perfect Dark, Mario Plus Rabbits, Just Dance. That's that's a really cool combination there. So I don't know what they're going to make, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm down. It's a pretty good name. I like their logo. Yeah, it, yeah. it's like a Studio Ghibli character. Is that or something. A, um, uh, Opossum? Or Opossum? I think it's a... Is it raccoon? Not a raccoon, yeah. <laughs> I don't, oh, I didn't think it it's looks like, like a flat. Bill nose. Murray is in Fantastic yeah. Mr. Fox. I think that's an opossum. Racist. No, George Clooney's the fox. <laughs> oh, badger. Badger. That's Isn't what it badger? is. Thank you. Oh you yeah, I guess like a badger. badger. Yeah. 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 Black Fuck and white. you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not a zoologist. <laughs> yeah, I, I think these are really good stories because uh, we'll talk about them in a little bit. But the industry has been hit a lot recently. But it's nice to see kind of the successful indie devs reach out to others, help them out, and then also you've got some AAA uh, creators who are stepping out of the AAA game to make better indie games. Uh, super excited about these. Yeah, um, love love what Devolver's doing and the Vampire Survivor devs. The that story, I feel like I heard like two months ago. I don't know. I don't know if they just like formally announced something, but I remember hearing this like a while ago. And I yeah. think maybe the new thing is the them telling the Web3 people to fuck off, basically, uh, which is yeah, always could great. Be. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, take a brief stop in the labor liminal zone. We do have uh, some three negative stories to talk about. First up, High Res Studios um, has had a lot of layoffs. Um I'm not sure the exact number here, but essentially the uh, CEO or president of high res put out a press release on Twitter saying, hey, we're trying to make these games like Smite 2 and Paladins, etc., but it's not quite working out uh, and they're going to have to let some people go. And there's been a lot of negative backlash to that. It looks like they've lost a lot of veterans over there at high res. We've also got Hitman 3 VR studio is going to lay off nearly all of its staff, according to employees that are speaking out. Uh, this is Leeds based XR games. Uh, like I said, they did the release of Hitman 3 VR Reloaded. I believe they're also working on Zombie Army VR and Starship Troopers Continuum. Uh, apparently, this studio had 84 people total, a VR game studio, which feels like that's your first fucking mistake, people. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, sorry to the people who lost their jobs, but if you're running a VR studio and you have 84 people there, what That's the fuck crazy. are you doing? Like that industry does not support that at all. Uh, and then finally, this is a new story from today. Apparently star citizen developer cloud Imperium games has imposed a mandatory seven day work week ahead of citizen con, which will take place later this month. Uh, this is an addition to mandatory overtime they've had previously this year. Um, if I may, I'd like to uh, read a quote here. There's a couple quotes here. It's very funny. Like they gave a very detailed mandate of how people are supposed to work during this period. Uh, and basically it's um, Fridays. You have to be in the office. Saturdays, you have to be in the office now. Uh, to be clear, this is just for the next two, three week period. But Friday, you have to be in the office. It's typically a work at home day. Saturday, you have to be in the office. And then Sunday, you can either work from home or you can work from the office, but you're expected to work. And then Monday through Thursday, I'm assuming is whatever their normal work is, work from home, et cetera. Um, and then they also have this line where they say that, uh, quote, you you need to, quote, need to be mindful of the hours they work and are asked to have 11 hours outside of work in each 24 hour period, end quote. So basically, hey, by the way, don't work more than 13 hours per day. Like this is this is one of the most clear cut examples of crunch. I cannot believe they let out this much fucking detail. In, Their whole thing is, has always been transparency. So, I mean, I guess they're transparent about how much they're crunching their developers. But yeah, you know. yeah, this is I mean, uh, to be clear, they they are not the only people, the only <laughs> studio who does this. But I this is the first time I've seen 
crunch be specified in a company-wide email and then immediately leaked to the press to verify that you know when naughty dog was doing crunch rockstar was doing crunch etc we heard about it because the spouses of the developers reached out etc mm. um, there's so many people in the comments of this article justifying it be like this doesn't sound too bad back in my day they took way more advantage of us and it's just like it's this isn't like well, this isn't like are, a volunteer you, thing. This isn't a yeah. I guarantee you these are salary employees too. There's no guarantee they are they are hourly and getting yeah. overtime pay yeah. for this. Yep, exactly. Well, like that it, is. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say it. It talks about them getting toil, which I've never heard of. Is that like a European thing? Time off in lieu, which yeah, we stored I, and used I, for. I think, so oh, it's basically they're yeah. accruing extra like PTO. Um, after the fact and it you know it's only two weeks or whatever it's still crunch right i mean and and the other thing like i okay you guys know i've made a couple videos on star citizen i have played star citizen i won't defend it but like it's interesting to me as a topic and uh as an an experimental kind of project that that it has continually grown over and over and over year after year i man i don't know this this is getting to the point now where it's like it's saying in the article the citizen con is their big yearly convention where they show off all the new tech that they've been working on um and it's for the first chapter of squadron 42 which was the original project that the kickstarter was meant to fund and it like at what point do do the does uh who's the guy who runs it um chris roberts uh chris roberts like at what point do you look at chris roberts as a leader and be like you've pushed this project past where it should have ended so many times why are we crunching now like what like what is it about this specific one and i have i have to say i think they're not raising as much money as they have been the past several years because mm-hmm. year after year the past like six years they raised like a hundred million dollars more than the previous year 50 million dollars more than that year and i think it's getting to the point of diminishing returns where it's like we have to push this out now like we have to show something because this is not sustainable unless we can get into a business model where it's not just like demo feeding an audience that is just full of whales um i don't know i i haven't played star citizen in probably almost a year since the last time that i that i actually booted it up and i don't know i haven't reached that point in my like play history where i'm like oh i'm gonna check out star citizen maybe after citizen con we can take a look at it but man i am just i don't know it's yeah. it's wild to me this also yeah, mentions at- that the toil the work loo thing is only available after squadron 42 comes out which imagine if you were promised that when the kickstarter was in 2013 the game's still not out but there's probably a people with like years worth of time off like yeah fuck that yeah they're currently at 726 million dollars raised um which is kind of funny because yeah. of one of the other things under the cut line that you added but uh keep going keep going yeah yeah it, it, it's one of those things where because they're getting this funding they probably don't feel pressure to put the game out in a way you know mm. well yeah um, that, that's what i'm saying is the past like six seven years that's how they've felt and i keep seeing yeah. like i've subscribed to a bunch of content creators who make content for star citizen or about star citizen and there have been at least the past like eight months where they're like hey, um, they're not actually meeting their goals like like uh-huh. for the money that they're trying to raise. So I think maybe it's reached a tipping point or at the very least it's plateaued. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, just to cap that off, I got a number for you. 12,700. That's how many people in the games industry have been laid off this year so far. <laughs> yeah, big number go up. Woo! Woo! Mm. Uh, moving on. Let's talk about some hardware news, specifically emulators and specifically Nintendo Two naughty, naughty Nintendo news this week. First of all, they've uh, reportedly forced the shutdown of Ryu Jinx, which is a switch emulator after Yuzu, which was shut down earlier this year. Um, And the other news is that they've been issuing copyright strikes to retro game core simply because retro game core typically in reviewing 
retro game devices uh, shows Nintendo emulators playing Nintendo games. Um, it's pretty fucked, both of these stories, right? Yep, it's fucked. I love that in yeah. the article for the Ryujinx one, they wouldn't confirm whether or not they came to an agreement. Like, yeah, yeah. And then they, so let me, Ninten Nintendo pointed them to someone who was like, I can't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the person who owns the project said, hey, I've been contacted by Nintendo. They want us to stop it. And they're, and I'm discussing it with them right now. They did not make their decision clear, but instead they shut down the entire GitHub repo and took the project offline. So people mm. assumed, hey, you know, they made a deal. I did see a little bit of uh, a rumor today. I saw a screenshot of somebody on the inside saying there was not a discussion. There was no settlement. They got a cease and desist from Nintendo, and that was enough for them to be scared enough into taking the emulator offline. Mm, so this, this feels like an instance in which, if you remember Yuzu, Yuzu fucked up, right? Like they were offering Nintendo games. They were offering yep. Nintendo proprietary code. They completely fucked up. And quite frankly, they yes, they should have been taken offline. They were a bad emulator. They were doing it the illegal way. Um, whereas by all accounts, Ryu Jinx was doing it correctly and legally through uh, reverse engineering and not offering any proprietary code. But Nintendo basically came in with a cease and desist and offered enough legal pressure for them to, to bow out. Emulators are legal. That is clear. Emulators are legal. Uh, this is pretty messed up. And, and the and the copyright strikes against the, the YouTube channel. That that just pisses me off because Retro Game yeah. Core is one of the best channels on YouTube for gaming. Yeah, uh, definitely go check them out. And to see them get a fucking copyright strike, which is they they appealed. They they didn't get an appeal for it. Like that, you get what two or three of those, and your whole channel is fucking gone. Yeah. And you'll never guess what what console it was emulating. Uh, it was a Wii U, right? <laughs> yeah, it was a Wii U yeah. emulator. Like the the like, I would understand if he was showing even a Switch one, or yeah. I mean, guess just a Switch one. But <laughs> being the Wii U, it's like he was doing a Virtual Boy one, and they took it down. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, do you yeah. do you think this kind of status quo is just going to hold for the foreseeable future with Nintendo kind of striking? Out? I mean, I know Japanese law is completely different than like American law, but it it doesn't seem tenable to me that this is going to keep happening when like like you just said, like emulators are legal. Like there's nothing illegal about them unless you're doing what what uh, Yuzu did. Um, yeah. I don't know. It just seems it seems like someone would pull like a, a Lewis Rossman and like reverse sue Nintendo for or, or counter mm. counter sue Nintendo for something. And like, I don't know. It just it, it's so annoying. Every time Nintendo is in the news for anything other than a game they're releasing, it's because they're suing someone or they're mm -hmm. shutting someone down or they're striking out. And it, I, I don't know. Yeah, I I think. In my opinion, I don't think this is going to slow down or go away. And quite frankly, it's a little bit of a miracle that we have lived with this gray space for so long. You yeah. know, you can get ROMs fucking anywhere. And a lot of those places are going away. Uh, you can stream entire fucking games on Twitch and watch somebody play an entire game. And a lot of that is not fair use. A lot of that could mm. very easily be a copyright strike. But we live in this moral gray zone where people are skirting the law but the industry players the developers and publishers say we we're okay with that we understand it's part of the community etc it feels like nintendo um either because of like an archaic legal mindset or because they're getting super pissed off at games like echoes of wisdom or tears of the kingdom or metroid dread being playable through an emulator weeks before the game actually comes out because of a combination of leaks and emulators and streaming it feels like the emulation for nintendo at least has caught up to present day and beyond and into mm. the future to an extent where they feel like they have to start acting against some of these things and then you got something like power world where i i don't agree with their power world lawsuit but you know uh common sense is they're they're probably treading a little bit too close to pokemon and nintendo says and from their perspective the way it's been described to me is they don't have a choice to not act in that situation. 
Because if yeah. they don't act and they allow it to happen, then the next person that comes along and rips them off, they, it's much harder to sue the second person because the second person can say, why did you let the first person do it? You set mm-hmm. a precedent that it's okay by not suing the first person. So I, I it does suck. It's it's it speaks to a larger thing in the web in total, how the web is in a worse space than it was previously because it used to be the Wild West and now it's a lot more monopolized and regulated. I, I think the games industry is starting to become that way as well. And part of that is Nintendo issuing lawsuits against ROM sites and emulation sucks. It does suck, but I don't want to say it's been a long time coming, but it's part it's part of an industry growing up. Yeah. yeah. And we need someone yeah. with like the person who's going to stand up against Nintendo is someone who has money enough to pay for it until Nintendo That's, loses and has to pay for the whole yeah. thing. We need like a Peter Thiel Hulk Hogan moment where <laughs> yeah. Hulk Hogan moment. Um, I don't know. It just it, I love Nintendo so much, but I hate like when they just get, you know, they, they really they tell the little guy to get fucked. I, I don't like that on like a I don't know. A capitalistic standard which i hate that i have but i don't know it's just annoying yeah. and i hate seeing like R- ria jinx like seems like it was a pretty solid platform for what it was and it just sucks to be like hey no not anymore yeah but, yeah well uh is that it for the news ian uh just one last piece of news you guys uh you guys ever played against steven spielberg in call of duty every night possibly <laughs> Possibly. Apparently, Steven Spielberg, according to his son, loves to play Call of Duty, loves shooters, but only plays with keyboard and mouse. He refuses to play console games with controllers. This is this is kind of wild, right? I really like, want to know. I really want to know what slurs he uses. Oh, uh, like all of them. It says he only plays the campaign. So, oh, OK. Oh, that's true. That's true. I forgot oh. about that part. Oh, yeah, dang. this reminds me. It's just always funny, like. Whenever this is this is one of the problems and like we talk about the industry and video games and community growing up, we're still kind of on the outside. Right. And it's one of those things where, you know, if you say, hey, I like video games, majority of people are like, oh, that kitty shit. Why haven't you grown up, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always good to hear like a celebrity or a famous person, you know, like Chrissy Teigen talking about I can't stop playing Luigi's Mansion. Uh, Do you guys remember when Robin Williams talked about pl- being obsessed with battlefield 2 and how he loved oh, playing this sniper. Talking about zelda <laughs> yeah no Ze- zelda yeah but when battlefield 2 was out he did some interview where he's like i can't stop playing battlefield 2 and it was I, like hilarious i i just found this out Whoopi goldberg is like a huge diablo fan wow like, she Ooh. she and she pl- she plays she wants to play on mac and she like petitioned Mm -hmm. the creator like she petitioned blizzard essentially to like please get this game on mac i want to play diablo 4 on my on my apple and she had some sort of a cannabis line that she was doing and they had a convention Uh and someone from blizzard went to the convention and gave her a pc and said you can play diablo 4 (laughs) on this instead which is hilarious but like i don't know whoopi is not i did not think that i would that she would play that game I don't think I put two and two together, but I, I distinctly remember some sort of article saying she was disappointed in Diablo four around the time when Diablo four came out. And now that makes way yeah. more sense. It was because she, she couldn't play it on her Mac. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this, the, the, the roundabout thing that I, I was smiling while you were reading the story, cause it just reminded me, Steven Spielberg was an executive producer, a medal of honor. And like, it's funny that he, oh, that's he, right. he yeah. like, like they were competitors for a long time and now he's like yeah. Medal of Honor is not really a thing anymore. So he just has to play Call of Duty. Yeah, we got to get him into hell let loose. Yeah. <laughs> him and Tom. Um, yeah, so it's great. <laughs> yeah. It's just always great to see people publicly and proudly own video games as a hobby. Uh, love to see it. Yeah, we love to see it. Uh, content call out. I'm assuming you put this here, Ian. I did. Yeah. I can't remember if we talked about it previous week or ended up uh, below the cut line, but uh, there is out now a 90 minute documentary from Xbox about the making of Stalker 2. If you're not aware, Stalker 2 is from a Ukrainian studio. Uh, The war in Ukraine broke out in the middle of their development. They've had some developers who have gone to the front lines and 
uh, unfortunately died as part of that war. So War Game, The Making of Stalker 2, 90-minute uh, documentary from Xbox about that studio now that the game is almost out. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but, you know, give all those guys the uh, the attention and credit they deserve and earned making a game like Stalker 2, which that alone is a big accomplishment in in a terrible situation. I forgot that. Oh, yeah. Did they move up the release date? Because it's November 20th now. I feel like I don't think they have. I don't think they ever moved it up. It, so that I think the, the December first date, date was, was last like, year, right? No. Well, I, I'm not going to say no, but the original the first release date they said was December of 21. Right. I remember because, that. Yeah. They've had to push it multiple, multiple, okay. multiple. But times. I think the one the last one I remember was a December date. So I think i just i think that was 2023 it was supposed to be december so and then it was Probably. february and then they pushed it one more time so that does make sense now but i i keep thinking december but it's november 20th and i'm, I'm extremely excited for that game um yeah about damn time it's looking uh, good. and i want to watch this uh documentary looks good is that it that's the show that's everything that's the show that's, that's, that's all everything. she wrote folks i'm gonna hit the button i'm gonna do it don't make me folks thank you so much for listening to this show we will be back next week of course with more local chat starring me ian and either zach or carl they're currently on the list we're gonna have them duke it out whoever lives dies on the show um we uh got tomorrow night uh at uh 7 p.m eastern i will be playing folks there is a, a a scary video game that comes out next week and your boy got an early copy of it and i'll be streaming it tomorrow i went down to the gaming store and they just had it there on the shelf for the playstation so i'll be playing it uh tomorrow night i'm very excited uh there'll be donation incentives sound alerts karen's uh hellbent on scaring me so come tune into that 7 p.m eastern tomorrow bring your wallets uh i tested out a japanese text-to-speech voice today and it felt oh, racist so be there for that <laughs> we'll see you all bye